Okay, morning everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to listen to this. Um, we're going to be talking about why you would use vulnerability intelligence. And uh, if there are any questions, I know this, the session says let's have questions at the end, but uh, let's, let's have them as we go along. I, th I think everybody tends to get a little bit more out of it that way. Now, I'm going to do this back to front. I'm not going to tell you about the company and the products. I'm going to tell you about the space and why we do what we do. And then I'll give you just a couple of slides at the end about, uh, about the products. Okay? So hopefully it'll be uh, relatively interesting. It's good to have a goal, isn't it? So let's start. This is me. I'm Rod White. I'm the enterprise salesperson for Secunia in the UK and Ireland. And at the back of the room is Victoria Bentham, the regional director. So uh, we're on hand for any questions afterwards, should we be swamped. OK, so let's have a look. What do we do today, right? How do we view the world? Well, you've got your environment, which has got all your lovely stuff in it, business data, employee data, all of your intelligence, the applications, your infrastructure, everything else that you need. And we have a view of the outside world, and it's got all the nasty stuff in it, and I've not tried to encapsulate all of it in that, obviously. But what we do, and what we have done for a long time, is line up all our defenses around the perimeter um, with a view to keeping all the nasty stuff out. Now, the reality is that it's, it's not really like that today. I mean, you have to do that stuff. And you'll see a lot of people talking about the detection of uh, patterns of behavior so that you can look internally and understand exactly uh, you know, when, you, when you've been penetrated, as it were. But if you, yeah. Thank you. Somebody laughed. Well done. Um, so, so we haven't just we haven't just got the perimeter defences anymore. What we're saying is that really there's an intersection. Okay, everything that you have in your infrastructure, all the applications you use, the data, the systems, the processes, all of that stuff is interacted and is under is interacting and is under attack from the outside world. So that's your attack surface, and. You know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm not giving you any clues, you know, I'm not, uh, this is not rocket science, but the reality is that people need to understand how to approach that, that space where their systems are being attacked that doesn't cover a firewall or a, you know, a, a secure router or whatever it happens to be, some piece of equipment that you plug into the environment. So let's talk about vulnerabilities for a second. Now, I'm not going to patronize you and tell you what a vulnerability is, but when you have them, there are typically three ways that they get classified. You either have a vulnerability that can be accessed from a remote, uh, a remote network, i.e. something that's connected to the internet, typically. And that's what people tend to view as the worst scenario. You don't even know who they are, you don't know where they are, and somebody is penetrating your environment and uh, doing nasty things to you. The next is local network, where somebody is physically sitting on your, in your environment. So a guy's rocked up in a yellow jacket, pretends to be from IT, and he's logging in. Well, you'd kind of hope somebody would notice that, although it obviously still does go on. And then you've got, obviously, the ones where they need physical access to your PC or piece of equipment. And unsurprisingly, you know, they rank in order of importance but everything is under attack and it, in, from one of those three methods, whether it's servers or phones, laptops, as we've seen with various uh, attacks last year, printers, you know, every kind of device that's got software in it. So if you start with a vulnerability, then to make it a threat, I mean, there are vulnerabilities out there that we will never know about, right? Because nobody's found them and nobody's commercialized them. Uh, and so what you have is a hacker finds a vulnerability and does something to it so that they can exploit it. That's when the thing becomes a threat for you. That's when you have to take action. I mean, clearly, if you know about vulnerabilities beforehand, you try and close them off. But we tend to find out about a lot of stuff when it, when it blows up. And if you look at things like um, Heartbleed and Shellshock last year, you know, the scale of some of these problems only becomes apparent when actually they get a name in the press and, uh, you know, everybody is suddenly talking about it. You know, even your wife, uh, your, fat, your, your husband, your, your kids even know about it. I mean, because let's face it, that's the only time anybody has a clue what we do, right? Because um, the rest of the time, you, you kind of, 
you're, you're branded as the person who can fix a laptop because you're in IT, right? Which is not, not a bad skill to have, but I mean, it is true. So once the hacker finds a vulnerability and finds a way to use it, then it's game on. That's when the clock starts running and exploit kits are produced and it starts to become a commercial problem. So clearly now, if you look at an application that's got a vulnerability, there can be many different types of exploits built off it. It is not a one-to-one -one relationship. And the point here is that, as you will see later on, the most effective way to close these things off is to close them off at source. Okay? So what we've got here is one vulnerability can equal many threats. Obviously, we've got some nice little pictures. Who deals with these things? Well, <clears throat> You can go and buy this stuff on the dark web in various places. We've all heard about it. Um, you can go and buy exploit kits. You can go and buy stuff that'll turn you know, what is seemingly innocent related stuff going and turning somebody's webcam on when uh, when they're not uh, when they don't realise it's on, or you know doing triv seemingly trivial things like that when in fact they're used to gather information about organisations and and. Uh, you know, steal sensitive data. The fact is that these things are sold and they're commercially available and you can go and buy one and they'll cost you a few hundred pounds or even less in some cases. And they're used by activists, cyber criminals, you know, governments in some case, <coughs> excuse me, governments in some cases. Now, let's spread that out. There's many, there are many vulnerabilities. There are many different kinds of exploits out there and they're all being sold. So they're bundled up. You can go and buy a suite of software that will give you any different number of forms to attack somebody. All you've got to then do is understand whether they are susceptible to those attacks. So we, we all know that attackers will uh, not just try, they, they try one way, oh, it doesn't work, I'll, I'll go and do somebody else then. They will try any number of different ways to get into your organization. Okay, this is, this is not rocket science. So the more uh, the more applications and devices that are exploited, the higher the risk, the higher the value, uh, and the higher the damage in, in most cases. So, if you deal with something like antivirus, then you look for behaviors, you look for patterns, you look for signatures of activity, and you stop those things from happening. Now, I am don't misunderstand me, I am not criticizing antivirus vendors. It is a very necessary thing. I mean, if you don't believe you need it, turn it off for two weeks and see what kind of a world of pain you end up in, right? So absolutely must have it, but what I am saying to you is there is something else that you can be doing as well. If I solve the original vulnerability, all of that goes away. I can close off 10, 12 uh, exploits that I'm, that I'm vulnerable to. So, you know, if you talk to CESG, they say that 80% uh, of security is good housekeeping, by which they mean patching. Yeah, do the basics. It's not sexy, it's not exciting, but do it. And you sort out most of your problems. And if you think you haven't got time to do it, the reality is you're probably spending a lot of time looking at stuff that's not that important. If you close off the vulnerabilities, the stuff that gets through, you really want to be dealing with, but at least you can identify it, you know? It's make your own lives easier. This is um, a graph of uh, an exploit. Uh, it's provided by Microsoft, so it's their data, but it's, of, uh, it's a typical scenario that we see with a lot of different vulnerabilities, okay? Now this one happens to be for an Adobe product, okay? I'm, I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I could have picked any application that's out there. But if you look at the red section, that's where the vulnerability is out there in the wild, and there aren't really very many exploits from it. That's, that's the zero day um, period, yeah? The blue section is day of disclosure, so it has become known that there is a vulnerability, and it go lasts for about a month before we go into the green section, which is where we see all of the actual attacks taking place. So why is that? Well, what's going on in that red to blue period is what I was describing earlier on. That thing is becoming commercialized. There are people out there working out how to turn that into a kit to sell to people. And the value of the kit is dependent on what it enables them to do. Can I get in and give myself elevated privileges? Bang, well, I'll have a nice big chunk of money for that. Thank you very much. And that's the way it works, right? But you see huge spikes of activity. 
Now, if you think about, bear that graph in mind for, for the next slide, because you know it's kind of important. That blue line, the start of the blue line, remember, is day of disclosure. That's when it was made public. So we deal with time to patch. And look at the stats at the bottom of that slide. 83% of all the vulnerabilities last year had a patch available at day of disclosure. So there really wasn't that much in the zero day kind of sphere that you had to worry about. What you had to worry about was doing the basics and making sure you'd covered off the 83%. Like I said, anything that gets through that is pretty serious and you, you, know, you wanna deal with it, but at least you'll be able to identify it. I mean, again, and I'm sorry if this seems like I'm preaching, you know, we're talking about doing basic stuff here. All right. So the problem space then. As a business, you use applications. There are many of them. Uh, you may be aware of, you may have a, a list of what is your, or what you consider to be your business critical apps, but there are many third party apps which have um, other third party software embedded in them. And we'll talk about that in a second. So there's something I like to call app creep. Um, so far, I, I keep using that term, but I'm the only one who's using it, so it's not getting adopted, but you know, uh, I like it. So when we talk to people, okay, and uh, we, we say, well, how are you dealing with your patching? Some people are quite honest and say, not really dealing with applications. We kind of do all our Microsoft stuff, but we don't do much else. Uh, so at least they recognize there's, a, there's an issue there. Some people think they're covering it using SCCM, which is obviously one of the Microsoft deployment tools. That's exactly the same as the first group, except they don't realize they've got a problem because they think they're covering everything. And, and some people are doing it in a manual ad hoc fashion. We do get conversations with people that say, well, we, we, do, the, uh, we do the top five you know, critical applications. Okay, fine. What about the other 80 you don't know are on your network? And uh, you know, it's, it's, it feels like you're doing something but actually you're not doing enough. And the problem is, right, let's be honest, we're all busy people. There are a million and one things to do. Typically there are less resources than there used to be to do it. So, you know, it's understandable. It's a time consuming thing. And again, it's not sexy. Do you wanna to go to the board and say, I want to spend some money and I'm gonna do some patching? Or do you wanna say, I'm gonna buy a sexy intrusion prevention and detection uh, kind of system and it'll cost X amount of money? It feels like you're doing more when you buy that stuff. Excuse me. Um, but it's, it's always about what's an effective use of your money. And again, I'm not criticizing intrusion detection and prevention systems, they are necessary, but it's about what do you do first? <coughs> Excuse me, that was in the microphone. I should have turned my head a little bit more, shouldn't I? So, um, the people who are doing it manually also have to deal with the fact that they are gonna miss things, okay? So they think they're covering everything off, but you've got a number of applications. That means you've got people who are sitting monitoring whether there are any new patches for those applications. They've then got to download it, have a look at it, read it, understand it. Does it apply to us? Uh, test it and then decide to roll it out to the system, uh, to, the, uh, to the environment. Okay, you can do that once a year, but really there are far more vulnerabilities than that. And I'm gonna to jump to the bottom of the slide here. We publish, a, um, we publish a, a yearly vulnerability analysis, okay? And it's not a sales document, it is simply what we've seen over the last year, the trends, the facts and the figures, all right? Now, if we looked at the top 50 applications, the portfolio of the top 50, they had, what, 1,400 vulnerabilities. That's on average about 80 vulnerabilities each. So you've got five business critical apps. That means you've got five people, if you're doing it manually, who are checking that stuff every day and doing it. Are you gonna do that process for 400 patches a year? Probably not. And it only takes one before you suddenly splashed over the front pages. Now I don't, I don't sell or, or talk to people based on fear, okay? There are plenty of products out in the marketplace that try and scare you. Look at how at, look at, how at risk you are. Um, we want to do that, because clearly it, it, de it demonstrates the need, but we're also talking about the next step where we help you solve them. But last year, in total, there were 15,500 vulnerabilities from about 4,000 unique uh, applications out of 500 vendors that we, we, we included in the report. 
Um, no surprises there, it's gone up 55% over the last five years. Well, I'm telling you that you're more vulnerable now than you used to be. Well, there's a big shock. I mean, you know, it's, it's again, not rocket science. The vast majority of those come from remote access, so somebody over the internet attacking you. So are you gonna take yourself completely off the internet? Probably not. So you've got to find a way to deal with this stuff. Here's just a few figures from our Q, one of our Q2 reports. You can go and get the uh, yearly report from our website. It's free of charge. We also publish uh, quarterly region reports. So that's what this is part of one of those. And they're there for you to go and look at, and uh, you can click on which region you're interested in. But you can see that there are 10 applications there. There are not really many surprises. Um, and number one is a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier on with a technology embedding another technology in it. Poor old Oracle, they would only have their own bugs to be worried about if they hadn't actually embedded Java in their product. They don't tell you to go download it, they supply it, therefore they end up at number one because Java is obviously one of the biggest attack services. It's not a shock. So again, you know, these are showing you, uh, that this is actually for the UK for, for Q2, what the worst offending applications were, all right? Now we also tell you what the um, end of life applications that you've got in your environment are because they're in some cases worse. If you have a bug in an application that is making you vulnerable, you can go to the vendor and say, I want you to fix it. If you've got an end of life application, you're on your own. And so what you've got to do then is find a strategy to deal with that. There may be reasons why you have that and you can't move away from it. It could be that you have other applications that are dependent on the version of Java um, or whatever it happens to be. Well, that's fine, but you've got to, you at least will be aware of it and try to, try to develop a strategy to, uh, to accommodate that so you're not exposing yourself. Um, and look at some of those examples in that list. There's stuff that revs a lot there. You know, Adobe, it seems like every other day we're having a, a, a patch release. Um, Google Chrome, no great surprises there either. So, you know, this is stuff that is in use within the organizations, and um, there's a fair bet in that you're going to find it in your environment. <coughs> in fact, when you look at it, um, there's, a, there's a worst day scenario uh, for people who buy our product. And it's day one, because you run your scans and you find suddenly, uh, when I say scan, I mean we're looking for certain file types, we're looking for applications, okay? I'm not talking about an AV in-depth kind of scan. But we find and build an asset list of all the applications that are in your environment. And that's usually the moment you go, oh my goodness, I thought we only had. And you find out there's all this other stuff that has crept into your environment. You know, that's, that's where you see where, what it is, what version it is at, um, what's end of life, and you will often find that you've got multiple versions of programs still hanging around on, on uh, servers or, or desktops or laptops that you didn't think you had. You will find that you've got 32 and 64-bit versions of things hanging around, which means you've got the same vulnerability twice that you've got to fix. You know, you find out all of this stuff, right? And this is all about you making an informed choice. <coughs> This is about you making efficient use of your time and deciding where you want to put your effort to fix things, all right? So, does it affect you? Well, do you know what you've got in your environment? Um, most people will say they have a pretty good idea, but there are always surprises. Do you, so do you know everything that you've got in your environment? Because it only takes one app, the small calculator that somebody's downloaded and sitting on their desktop that you didn't know about, that is gradually leaking data or elevating the privileges of some process that you don't know is running. It, it, it only takes one thing. And you think, well, okay, look, I patch all of my Microsoft products. I'm pretty good, right? 80% of the vulnerabilities last year were in non-Microsoft products. So even if you're bang on up to date, you're at best 20% patched. You judge the risk for yourselves. So, you might ask me, and I'd like you to ask me, um, how do I know if it affects me? You know, what's the scale of the problem? There are a number of ways that we can look at this, okay? We can do something that's called a quick scan. 
which takes five, 10 minutes, and uh, you do it over the phone, you scan your machine and you see how patched your machine is. Now, typically, bearing in mind that when we talk to people, we are talking to security people or IT people, people at least who have a security awareness, and we never, ever see a 100% patched machine unless it's an absolutely clean install that has never been anywhere near the internet, all right? And it's quite an eye-opener. It's not meant to frighten you. No, no, it is meant to frighten you, but it's meant to do it in a way that at least allows you to gauge the problem. I'm security aware and my machine is 70% patched. And believe me, 70% is good to some of the things that we actually see. But what you get out of that is a list of all the applications, what's end of life, what versions, where it is. You know, you can tell what's going on with your environment. And if your machine is like that, what's the rest of the environment like? That's the question that's asked. So we often have to do this um, to help people build business cases to take this forward because typically it's not something that people have thought about in terms of you know, taking this forward to my organization. So we understand there's a process that has to be gone through and we can do certain things to help you with that. But if you want to have a look at that, we can do that for you. It takes, like I said, a few minutes. Um, talk to us outside and we can arrange that for you. So... I'm at the back end of the presentation now, okay? So now I'm going to talk about the company, so don't all leave. But who we are, right? We're Secunia, and I should say, now part of Flexera Software, as we were purchased a week and a half ago. We're a Danish company, are a Danish company. We're based in Copenhagen, we're about 100 people, and we've got offices around the world, as you would expect. The more interesting stuff is that we collaborate in a number of organizations and open standards and open systems because we take our responsibility into the security marketplace very seriously. We've been doing research for a long time, and so we do join in and we do share um, in a sensible manner. Um, we are also the first and only Vulnerability Security Alliance partner with Microsoft. Now, Microsoft, if you talk to them, well, I'm not putting words in their mouth. If you talk to them about third-party patching, they will point you to us, right? They go out and independently talk about us without telling us, which is great for uh, uh, us to have, you know? And that's because... <coughs> sorry. Uh, we're, we're obviously members of their, their System Center Alliance program, and all of our technology is in use across their um, uh, technology centers. They love this stuff, right? They rolled it out to their entire estate. It took them about an hour and a half, and they absolutely love us. And they go out and talk about us, and they evangelize about our products because they know that patching is... It, it's, it's a funny thing. They know that patching is an important thing. I mean, look how, look how tried and tested the Microsoft deployment paths are, right? We all know about it, and yet people still think, oh, bloody Microsoft, they're buggy. Right? Well, yeah, they have bugs, so does every piece of software that exists in the world today, but they're really good at fixing theirs. And so they want to get to the point where people understand they're not the problem, and there are other things you can be doing to make your, problem, make your, your problems go away and your system secure. So it's really sensible from them to adopt a, 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 a security alliance partner like ourselves. Now, I want to talk about research. Um, back in the day, Secunia started off as a, as a research, pure research organization, and then we started selling the vulnerability awareness that we generated into organizations as a service. We formed that into two products, but because we've been doing it so long, we've got a huge database of vulnerabilities and applications that we can work with. There's over 55,000 um, different applications that we can work with across your, in, your infrastructure. Um, that's quite a number. <coughs> <clears throat> but the research team is still there, and they form a core part of all the products that we, ha that we have. And on a daily basis, they monitor a few thousand um, hacker-related websites. They subscribe to all the uh, disclosure lists. They monitor CVEs to make sure we don't miss anything. We do our own research. We do our own ethical hacking as well, if you want to put it like that. But we're part of a responsible disclosure program. So, you know... Everything that we do is based on giving the vendor a chance to fix things as well as giving you the best information so that you can protect yourself. And all of that is, is unique IP to Secunia, and we do not share it with anyone else. Um, so if people claim to have the biggest and the best, um, I think you need to look at where their claims are coming from. 
One of the products that this forms the, bo the backbone of is the Vulnerability Intelligence Manager. Now what this does um, is take an asset list of everything on your infrastructure. So it's not only operating systems and applications, it deals with switches, routers, firewalls, versions of firmware, anything that you care to throw at it. And it gives you a live feed onto the known vulnerabilities that uh, are in your infrastructure. Now this is a tool that people use to assess their risk. Okay? They take that, they look at it, and they decide what's important. Now there are various reports that you can generate out of it, of course, you know, showing you where things are, what criticality things are. Because not only do we publish vulnerabilities that give you um, CVE score, uh, yeah, CVSS scores, rather, um, we also give you our own CVSS assessment. Because some vendors sometimes over uh, inflate the level of severity of the uh, vulnerability that they're pushing out simply to make sure that everybody patches it. I, I can understand that, right? But you need to understand where you spend your time, what's important to you. So you need an independent analysis of that. So we give you that score as well. We show you which vulnerability affects which products, what the impact of it is, who discovered it, you know, there's a lot of information in there. And like I said, it's all about informed choice. If you have this information, you can decide, is it important to me? A particular application, for example, might be susceptible to remote access across the internet. But you might look at that and say, actually, that's only on internal machines it, that aren't connected to the internet. Therefore, I will patch it at some point, but I'm not going to patch it as a priority. I'll put my effort into something else. You know, it's, it's that conversation that you need to have. <clears throat> now, the corporate software inspector is the thing that goes a little bit further than that, all right? So it will scan your environment, it will find an asset list of all of the applications, and we don't just look at standard installation paths, we will find it if it's anywhere, if it's just on the desktop or somebody's downloaded it through a browser and it's not even installed, we will find it. You will get a full list of everything that you've got. Now. There are, there are a number of ways of getting hold of that data, right? But once you've got it, you know what the situation is. Well, then you work with the vulnerability data to understand what I need to remove, what I need to patch, which versions need to be gone, and so on and so forth, until you get a list of applications in your environment that you wish to maintain. And from that point on, you go into a monitor mode. Because let's talk about workflow here. As I said earlier on, everybody's busy. You haven't got time to be spending looking at this thing all day, every day. What you don't need is another pane of glass that's going to make your life uh, busier, right? So you've got to do some work at the front end to, to solve all your patching problems or the ones that you currently have. But once you've done that, the tool will go into an alerting mode. You define the criteria, but the thing will tell you in this Say you were doing it based on geography. In this location, um, the number of vulnerable applications excuse me, has increased. So that's a trigger for you to go and look and see what's going on. Or, you know, the, 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 I've received a high criticality um, vulnerability in this part of the, the environment. That's the kind of information that you get out of it. So your guys can be doing something else in the meantime. They will get the triggers. They will know that they've got to go and do something. Now, there's also a compliance element. Many people have to deal with compliance, whether it's an internal standard or something like PCI or for the government PSN, where you've got to patch within a defined period of time. Well, how do you know what you've got to patch? Well, clearly you can run reports that say, show me everything of moderately high criticality, for example, that I've known about for more than 30 days. Well, that right there is your what would make me fail compliance if I submitted today report. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's different ways of cutting the data that, that can actually help you do what you need to do on a daily basis. And we have some government, uh, some local authorities who use that as part of their submission for PSN compliance, for example. You know, they print it out every month or every week or whatever it happens to be, and they, that this is where I started, these are the things I've done. Because compliance is always a goal. You know, it's not, you are never, I'm compliant, I'm done. It's, I am compliant today, how do I stay compliant? It is always a journey, and you have to show you what the steps you've taken along that path. Okay. 
Now, we're integrated with the Microsoft deployment tools, SCCM and WSUS. So when we say that, the implication of that from a workflow perspective is that we are not giving you another tool that makes you learn something else. A lot of organizations are using WSUS. It's free. It comes from Microsoft. Why would you not? A lot of organizations are paying and using SCCM because they get extra control. But the reality is what you've got is a process that's in place that you're probably using to patch all your Microsoft applications. Well, why would you do something else? What you do with CSI is put your arms around your third-party estate and include it in the same process. It just makes sense. Now, also, many of you will have custom applications that you've had written for your organizations. Well, fine, you can track those as well. Now, whilst we won't be able to tell you what vulnerabilities are aware, uh, available in it because it's not commercially available software, what we can do is allow you to patch it through the same mechanisms as well. So you've now got your hands around your entire application estate, and that only gives you time back, okay? Just uh, the ubiquitous who are our customers slide that everybody seems to need. Um, there's just a few of them. There are many more on our website if you'd like to go and look. But you see in banks, you see in large commercial organizations, you're seeing people who do care very deeply about security and compliance and all the other lovely things that we've just talked about. And the reality is every one of these organizations needs to get their time back, needs to cut down the amount of work that they're giving their people while still maintaining security and being compliant. <coughs> oh, I'll be so glad when this is gone. Um, but that's where we are, right? I mean, these, these are some of the kinds of examples. Now, if you go onto our website, with most of these, you can see a little bit of a quote or a little bit of a story behind them, okay? We can talk about them to you outside if you're interested. <coughs>